This was almost a year ago. It happened in mid to late April of 2019. On my drive home from working a long day, I came across a sharp bend in the road where out of nowhere, a deer jumps out in front of my Dodge Ram and I collided with it. I don't know why, but its momentum must have propelled it a certain way because it shot off to the side of the road instead of over my truck. My truck did a little glitch thing. Everything turned off and right back on within a split second, like the car or engine malfunctioned. The impact was hard and felt like it damaged my front badly by the impact alone. Shit, 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 I told myself, quickly pulling over into the pullout right next to me. I jumped out of my truck, eager to see if there was really any damage. I had my nifty little utility flashlight with me, so even in the dead of night, I was able to fully check my truck for any serious markings or damaged. It looked fairly clean. Nothing too bad was done to it. I was very surprised considering the impact itself was immense. After taking a few quick moments to scan my vehicle, I turned to my left and directly where my headlights were hitting was the doe I just hit. She was a big son of a gun. I must have hit her good because her head looked pretty smashed in, blood oozing out the side of her face and mouth. I was doing a good 50 miles an hour around that curb. I know the roads well, so I guess I get a little lax sometimes when it comes to good driving. I'm looking at this dead doe, just trying to take it in that I almost destroyed my truck. Sigh. And then before I get back in the truck, I figure it might be a good idea to pop my hood and just double check to make sure everything is okay. I'm not sure if turning off and on real quick is some kind of safety mechanism or what, but I thought I'd be sure. I pop the hood and I start taking a quick gander to look and see if anything got damaged, bent, or popped out of place. Everything looked fine, and as I'm going to reach up to close the hood, I feel these dagger-like eyes on me. What I mean by that is I felt the strongest feeling I've ever felt of somebody watching me. It didn't feel good though. It felt bad, like someone was 20 feet behind me, coming at me with a knife. I've never felt such immediate fear in my life. I turn around, and keep in mind my headlights are fully illuminating everything in front of me. Now, I see the dead deer still. I hear this growl that has so much bass to it. I freeze and tense up, thinking I just angered a huge bear or something. Out of the trees pops this huge wolf-looking face, but uglier. It takes one look at me, then look down at the dead doe. It looked right back up at me without even breaking a second of eye contact. This huge hairy black arm reaches out below it and grabs the doe by the neck and pulls it back into the trees with it, never once breaking eye contact. It disappears altogether. I practically pissed myself. I was so terrified. Without even turning around, I just got back in my truck. The hood did get closed. And I flew out of there so fast. For some reason, my mind goes to a giant man-eating badger looking thing, but it was very wolf-like. Absolutely huge head. I'm talking huge. When I was much younger, I was an avid outdoorsman and a hunter primarily hunting bear. It's a passion of mine that I loved. I used to hunt black bear mainly, although I had gone grizzly hunting a few times here and there with my cousins up in Alaska. I was on a crazy outdoor trek about a few years ago, fell off a small 30-foot incline, and shattered both of my legs. Had I fallen any other way, I would have basically been toast. Thank you, Lord, for that. But that's not why I'm writing to you. When I used to bear hunt, I used to encounter all sorts of beasts being out in the wild. I was born in the city and spent a lot of my time there in my life, and I did not get a hand at taming the wild till I was later in my teens and befriended those who made this way of life. They taught me a lot in a very short amount of time, and I do owe a lot to them. Not only have I encountered dogmen on multiple occasions, but also Bigfoots as well. Both are beasts in their own right, and you want to respect and be very careful of. Both can easily kill you if you're not careful. 
That's why you need to be respectful to the things around you when you're out there. I mean, I have had instances where I was out tracking this big black bear one time, and I came across these bigger, larger-than-life canine tracks in the soft dirt. This was after I had seen one already, so I didn't take long to figure out what these tracks belonged to. The stride on these tracks, though, had to have been five feet easily. Massive prints. Bigger than the size of my hand. They went on for maybe 40 yards and disappeared into the thick forest. The most haunting detail that gets me every time is that the prints looked bipedal and not quadrupedal. I knew what it belonged to, but I didn't want to acknowledge these things. I've since come to terms with them and them living around where I hunted later on, but at that time it was a tough pill to swallow, even more so than Bigfoot. At least Bigfoot there's some sort of introduction to its existence with the powder film and just basic general knowledge of Bigfoot in modern day pop culture. I had never heard of a dogman at the time, the first one that I saw one. That's why I had a much harder time dealing with it. My first encounter with these things was two years after that previous story. I was hunting black bears again and I had caught the tracks of this one black bear. These tracks led me a little further in the direction of these mountains. I wasn't totally familiar with them but I didn't think too much of it. After a little ways in, I had these two large, well, werewolf-looking creatures stalking me from further back up in the trees. Scared the hell out of me. I wasn't going to keep following those bear tracks anymore. I got out of there, and quick. I had no idea what kind of animals I was dealing with, and I wasn't about to be ignorant at the time. You have to understand that these things were huge. At first, they looked like two wild dogs, the size of horses, darting back and forth between the trees. Then, I saw both of them stand up on two legs, turned me whiter than a ghost. I would continue to run into these same two dogmen in the years to come. That's for another day, though. The next encounter was about five months later, when I was out hiking in that part of the woods again, and felt the same feelings as last time, but much more intense. I checked my surroundings, and the scariest thing was that I remembered and recognized the feeling. I just couldn't see them anywhere. That told me that they were already almost up on me, or about to be. I got out of there, not waiting around to find out. I had completely forgotten all about last time until I felt that despicable feeling once again. The memories came flooding right back at the time. That's how I knew. I had a couple of encounters with Bigfoot too, in the very same area, but I never saw any of them at the same time. My Bigfoot encounters were similar, but not aggressive in any way, not like these things. I believe that Bigfoot are much more docile, curious creatures. Not the dogmen though, I believe they are all full of ill intent, and their auras are so much darker. I believe they were trying to drive me out of their den or territory, whatever it was that I must have come into. It was always that same general area in the mountains every time I would encounter them. I had ventured off into that same area of the mountains more often than not afterwards and not always had those ominous experiences. I was always equipped with at least a machete and a Glock 45 going back there, just in case anything happened. There's a big river if you travel back far enough. It's quite the scene, but I stopped going back in there after a while. Another time was going back in the mountain range, and I'm pretty sure I ended up sneaking up on one of those things. Came across a large clearing with a large boulder, about the size of a small house, off of about 200 yards away. Crouching on the top, clear as day, was one of those dog creatures I had seen previous. It was clear daytime and it was no mistaking what it was by its shape. It was not a bear. It was clearly canine by the head and upper body. I could see that it was fixated heavily on something moving off in the trees that I couldn't see. It wasn't moving much either, so I sat there and watched it for moments before moving on in the opposite direction. It was summer in 2011. I was exploring with a friend. I had lived in Portland, Oregon at the time, 
and this friend of mine lived down in central Oregon, out in the middle of nowhere, where there's dilapidated buildings, lots of desolate farmland, not much out there, really. Took a trip out to his place and got bored pretty quickly. We wanted to go out exploring and check out everything around, but some of the old homesteads in the area weren't exactly safe, but that's what draws us to it. My friend hadn't actually explored the area much beyond what our eyes would show around his house. I thought this would have been the perfect evening to go wandering out in the middle of nowhere with a joint and just two guys out on an adventure. Well, I ended up forgetting the joint in my car, so we just went without. We went a few miles away from his house to several different old homesteads, all dilapidated, worn down, hadn't been used in years, nothing but desolate farmland around. This was in the summer, so it was arid, dry, and hot. We checked out three homesteads that weren't far apart in the same area. We loved the character of each one. In fact, my friend, being the photography buff he is, brought out his camera and we did some really sick portfolio shots. Anyway, we saw this huge rundown barn next to a corn mill off in the distance. Further away from his house than we were already were, we decided to end the adventure after going down there and taking some cool portrait shots. As we approached this old barn, this place was truly massive. We walked around and tried to get some really good shots, but my friend noticed his camera was really acting up all of a sudden. Both of our phones were too. Not turning on, showing we had a dead battery when both had been nearly fully charged before we even left. Things like that. It was strange. I should probably mention how bad the smell was in this barn. Not only was it an old musty old barn, but it reeked like wet dog. It was terrible. I think after hanging around for maybe 20 minutes, my friend mentioned to me we should cut things short and head back. I don't think he was feeling well. He told me he started feeling really run down all of a sudden and just didn't feel good. My stomach felt knotted up and my hairs were standing on end, but I wasn't quite sure why. We left and walked out two hours back to his house. Even halfway back to his house, he was telling me he wasn't feeling ill anymore and we talked about it much more when we got back. He seemed confused at the reason why both of us felt so strange in that barn, not to mention his camera and our devices that kept turning off and acting like they were dying. It was truly strange. I told him it could have been one of the spots on the earth, you know, where there's those magnetic shifts, kind of like the Bermuda Triangle, but I have absolutely no idea. I know this used to be a heavy native territory hundreds of years ago, but that's it. Nothing else really interesting happened during the rest of the visit, but that always sticks out to me for some weird reason. I was only 19 when this happened to me. It was back in the early fall of 1981, when I was spending a lot of my time working. When I was 19, I lived outside of Fayetteville, not too far, about 30 or so miles away in a small town known to many as Siloam Springs. Because of the job I worked at, it would require me to pull later shifts since I would usually be covering more than just my job. I had a good-for-nothing boss at the time who insisted that it save the company more money by throwing their employees with bigger tasks and workloads, but no overtime pay. But that's a story for another day. One evening, I was driving back home outside of Fayetteville along Highway 68. I'm probably on the road for no more than a couple of minutes before my eyes catch something. This tall figure walking alongside the road about 50 feet away from the car. As I pull closer to it, I can see that this looked to be someone in an elaborate werewolf in London costume from way back. Why would they be wandering the side of the road out here? I thought the whole thing was strange. But then I got closer, and what I thought to be a person actually turned its head. I realized in that moment, it wasn't just somebody having a convincing werewolf costume party. If there was ever a living werewolf, this was it. I just remember how scary its face looked. 
I think my headlights caught its attention because as it turned around, it also lifted up its arm as if to shield its eyes from the light. After standing there for a second, it quickly vanished off the road on the same side it was on. Freaked me the hell out. I had seen enough to know that it was not a person. A person doesn't act like that in a costume or move like that. I could tell even in the poor lighting, its fur had to be thick, it was long and stringly. Think of a long-haired fluffy dog, I guess. I'm not sure how to explain it. It had a longer snout, but the upper part of its face is what I think was more fierce looking. It just had an angry expression. You know how dogs can look when they're happy, or even when they're mad? It was the same kind of thing. It just seemed to have a scowl on its face. I saw it for what felt like an eternity, but it did raise up its arm fairly quickly to shield its eyes from my headlights. When I had seen it, I came down almost to a stop to cruise and to try to figure out what it was I was looking at. Never in all my years have I ever seen such a thing. I know about Bigfoots, but I don't know what it is I encountered that night. February 2016 I heard my dog barking and growling right around 3 a.m. one night. I got up and went to our back door to see what she was barking at. When I did, I saw her running up and down the backyard fence line, barking, growling, and urinating all along the fence with her tail tucked in. My first thought was predator. I knew something was wrong. I focused my eyes to see if I could see what she was barking at and whispered, holy shit. I saw something bent over in a circle that was black and looked like it had a mane, like a lion. I looked at it for about 15 seconds and decided to run to the bedroom and get my head wrapped light. I put it on my head and ran to the back den and saw that it was still there. I carefully turned on the light and shined it right on it. When I did, it turned around and looked right in my direction. Then it ran down the fence line with a smaller one in front of it. The best way I can describe it would be to say that it was the size of a lion. It had yellow eyes, pointed ears, huge shoulders, and a huge chest. It ran on all fours. Also, this thing was so fast that it only took about two seconds to run down the entire fence line. This wolf was way faster than my dog. I woke up my wife and told her what had just happened. Then we went to the computer and googled huge wolves in America. Under images, I found a cartoon of a drawing that somebody did, and its head and mane looked just like what I saw. It was called a dogman. Today is April 25th, 2016. September 13th, 2013. Before I say anything about my encounter, I just want to clarify that when I saw this thing, I went to Google and searched up what it was. I came across this website and found that another person in Jackson County had an encounter with something like this, so I know I'm not crazy. I had been studying wolves and their behavior for about three years before I had this encounter, and I know that considering Jackson County is about 656 square miles with a population of around 675,000 and it being practically infested with wildlife such as deer, livestock, and predators such as coyotes and foxes. It wouldn't be likely for a large predator such as a wolf to be lurking in the sparse woodlands. The average wolf territory is around 13 to 2400 square miles and it'd be easy for such a huge creature to live just in Jackson County alone. This may be even the very same dog, wolf, man thing that the other person saw. Anyway, on to the encounter. I was just chilling on the laptop in the living room, watching people blow stuff up, when I felt like I had to go to the bathroom. I set the laptop down and put my headphones on the keyboard and go out of the chair. Let me clarify. I'm not a bloody psychic or a medium or anything, but I have a sort of sixth sense to where I can tell if something is watching me, and I knew something was. 
We have a huge window on the wall, just above the couch, and it was on a particularly cold night, so the windows caught things like breath fairly well. I turned to the window, thinking that whatever it was watching me from there, and I knew I'd see it if it was, since we have motion sensing floodlights, and it'd have to be either standing on something or tall as the devil himself in order to see into the window of our trailer, since it was around 6 to 8 feet off the ground, with the top of it being about 11 feet. I looked over the window, and the only thing I could see was the floodlights were on and something seemed to duck under the window, like a kid playing hide and seek. I didn't think anything of it, considering our neighbors were a sort of druggy and alcoholic kind of family, and often came to look in our windows, and every opening to the house was locked. Because of this, I had nothing to worry about. I went to the bathroom, and when I had finished, I washed my hands and went back to the laptop. I noticed that the floodlights went out, so whatever it was was gone. Not thinking anything else of it, I went back to watching people blow stuff up. I should mention also that my eyes are sharp, sharp enough to spot a bird about 50 feet away in a tree, so it's no surprise that when the floodlight came back on, I noticed it immediately. I glanced up from the screen, expecting a drunken or high idiot to be looking in with a stupid expression on his face, but I was frozen by what I saw. It was a huge, huge wolf that was looking at me with dirty, ambery yellow eyes. Its ears looked like they were torn or cropped or something, and the face looked somewhat human. Not really a full human face, but more like the jawline looked very masculine and the human compared to the rest of its face. Its lips were curled back, and it seemed as if it were snarling, though I couldn't hear if it was, and its breath caught on the cold glass. It was so tall that the top of its head was halfway up the window, and if I had to guess how wide it was, I'd probably say maybe the width of my shoulders. I knew that whatever it was, it most likely had wolf instincts, so I did the only thing I knew to do, which was avoid eye contact and make yourself look as small as possible as you could whilst having your throat and underside showing. This is a very common submissive position, and although I was scared out of my mind, I knew that holding eye contact would make it seem like a challenger and running would make me seem like prey. When I did the submissive position, it must have worked for it to leave me alone because it just hit the window, which made the entire trailer shake and it went away. I hadn't heard or seen anything else like it since, although I do hear the odd howl coming from the back roads. God help the poor idiot that decides to try and hunt this thing down. I can tell you now that whatever it was was not friendly, because if it were, it wouldn't have slammed my window as hard as it had, and it would not have been growling like I'd taken its food. Although it practically did assault my window, I could understand why it was upset. I was on its territory, after all, an intruder and possibly a threat to its existence and its prey. It's really just best to stay out of its way and respect it. After all, it is one of God's many strange creatures in the world. December 2013 I used to work about 30 miles away from where I live. One night, I had been stuck in heavy traffic coming home. I take Lassix, so after a while, I really had to go to the bathroom. I kept telling myself that I was almost home and tried to hold it until I got there. By the time I got to my exit, I knew I wasn't going to make it to my house, so I pulled up to an area where Fidelity Investments is located and found an area that was isolated. This area is heavily wooded with walking trails and a lot of game, but it is also in a very populated area. I pulled up a little side drive off one of the main roads. That little drive is about 100 feet long with only room for one car. It went up an elevation and had bushes on the right side facing the main road. On the left side, there was a guardrail and a view of the valley below. The area up there is huge and isolated with several buildings that are all spaced out. The place is dark at night because there are intermittent streetlights up there. At night, it's pretty deserted too. A few cars go through that area, 
though, because it's a shortcut people use to go from Taylor Mill over to 3L Highway, where there are stores, restaurants, etc. When you're up there, you're above everything around this area. When I stopped, I got out of my car, waited a moment and looked around to make sure there were no other cars. It was winter, so the bushes between where I was and the road below me didn't have many leaves on them. Because of that, you could see right through them. I was up on this little rise, about 20 or 30 feet above the drive, which was four lanes wide. To the left of me was a street light and more woods that went down another hill to the main road. I went to the back of my car and did what I had to do. When I finished, I stood up, and all at once, every hair on my body stood up. I knew I wasn't alone. I scanned the area in front of me, and must have heard something behind me, because I turned around and there were three deer standing there, all huddled up together, between my car and the guardrail. They weren't looking at me, they were looking across the road. I looked back over there, and that was when I saw a figure standing between the bushes in front of it and the tree line behind it. It was huge. I stand 5'5". Five five. Some of those bushes were about 6 feet tall, but they only came up to about the collarbone area on this thing. Due to the street light to the right of it, about 20 feet away, I was able to get a pretty clean outline of this thing. It had a large dog-shaped head and pointed ears. I couldn't make out its neck, but I could make out massive shoulders. That's when it growled at me. It was a deep vibration I could feel in my chest. My body just took over at that point. I have to explain this part of it to you. I worked security for years in California in the music business. As a woman, I have to really work out and train to defend myself. I kicked box for eight years and worked out every single day. I also trained dogs mainly Anatolian Shepherds and German Shepherds. Sometimes I have to establish who is the Alpha, and to do that, I get them down, hold them in place, grab them by their ear, and growl until they submit. Then the training can start. So when this thing growled at me, it was just pure instinct. I dropped down to a crouching position and growled right back at it. When I did that, it stopped growling and started sniffing the air. Its snout went up and turned its head slightly as it was sniffing. It then took a few steps forward. I was still crouched down on all fours, moved forward, still growling at the thing. When I did that, it stopped. I stood up, kept staring right at it. I never broke eye contact with it. Then it slowly stepped back into the tree line until I couldn't make it out as clearly as before and started to move to the right of me. The deer were still behind me. They were so close I could have reached out and touched them. I waved my arms and told them to get out of there. When I did that, they went back over the guardrail and took off down the hill. That's when I jumped in my car and got out of there as fast as I could. I felt this thing was trying to circle behind me and I wasn't going to wait around for that. Do I think I scared it? No. But I do think I confused it for a couple of minutes and that gave me some time to move. I had told my husband about what happened up there, but I didn't tell him exactly what I saw. He would think I was nuts, and to be honest, I thought I was a little crazy myself until I saw a picture of a dogman. I know there are other things in this world that can't be explained. I've seen them, but this was beyond any of those things. Since this happened, I can't take that shortcut through that area anymore. My husband took me back over that way once to see the area and I was begging him to get me out of there the whole time. I thought I was going to throw up. The wildlife up there has almost totally disappeared. I never see anything up on the hills anymore. The street I live on is only about one mile or so down the hill from this place and lately we have seen coyotes on the streets like they have been chased out and pets here have started to go missing. We've also seen a large black figure moving through our backyards down here. The dogs throughout the neighborhood go crazy regularly now too. People were calling the cops when we saw that large black figure jumping fences. I'm concerned that it has come down the hill after eating everything up there.
I should start off explaining that my partner and I are experienced Bigfoot investigators who are in a unique situation, as we have a family group living in our research area. Last October, during the full moon, my partner and I were on our hilltop having quite a bit of success with two juveniles and one adult that we noticed. We could hear them walking in the leaf litter, and every once in a while, we could also hear a clack or wood knock from different directions. After a while, it seemed the feeling of fun for them dissipated and became a lot more cautious. Mike heard something to our north and went a ways down to investigate while I stayed by the camp, just to make sure it wasn't a diversion. He came back in a rush and said he had seen one of the young ones come out of the woodline, running for the other side of the fire break, and what was following, he said, he couldn't comprehend. It was about six feet tall, with pointy ears and a long snout. At this point, I have to say that neither of us have really given any creed to the whole dogman, wolfman, grassman theory. We just thought it was a mistaken identification of a Bigfoot or a bear. I had purchased a 40 caliber handgun and some hydroshock ammunition for it earlier that day, so it was in my vehicle. After Mike had explained what he had seen, I retrieved my weapon and loaded it. All the while, we could hear the two young ones chattering and the big one stomping all to our backside. They were pissed or upset about something and they never acted that way with us. I had Mike take me down the fire break to where he saw this creature and with spotlights, we scanned the area. We could hear something moving around and a few short growls. Finally, Mike caught it with the spotlight going between trees and what I witnessed is something I would never have dreamed of seeing except on a movie screen. A six foot wolf walking on its hind legs. I fired my weapon in the air and it turned to the southeast into the woods. We cautiously made our way back to camp but we could hear this thing pacing us to our left. As we got back to camp we kept listening to this thing approaching us from the woods. Mike turned on the spotlight and I leveled my gun wherever the sound was coming from. It was approaching us without fear, and it felt to both of us like it was stalking us, as it was one of our juvies that Mike had witnessed. It came out from between the trees, and I shot it square in the ribs at about 20 yards away. We measured the next day, and I am a very good shot. I saw the wound, and know without a doubt I hit it. It fell to the ground, but immediately got up and ran to the southeast. We could hear it crash through the brush, and we even heard it fall down or trip over something. But it continued to head in pretty much a southerly direction, down the hill, paralleling the fire break. We were both freaked out by this time and broke camp and left. The next morning, I loaded up a few extra clips and we went back up to see if it died somewhere close or was just wounded so we felt we had to track it down. We did track it from the point where I shot it, all the way down the canyon, and even found where it made such a ruckus when it fell. The leaf litter was up all ended, and was fairly easy to track. At one point, we did find a perfect canine track in the mud ridge, but it was over 8 inches across. The thing that absolutely baffled both of us was that there was no blood trail. None. We both saw the bullet hit, Yet, no blood? We tracked it all the way down the canyon until we lost the trail. We talked to a Native American couple we know, and they immediately said Skinwalker. We contacted a few other investigators to try and figure out what in the hell happened. I mentioned before that neither of us took any creed from any dogman reportings, but I do know that neither of us wants to experience it again, and I have never gone out in the woods unarmed since that day. Hi what lurks beneath, it's me again. I know we haven't spoken in a few weeks, but I hope you're safe amidst all of this craziness. So I got a chance to talk to my family and friends over the past three weeks about some of their personal encounters that they've each had. Terry has also had a couple of encounters with a skinwalker and a dogman. It's been a wild ride for sure, and it seems that as we are easing into spring, things are becoming a little more lively. 
Terry's family, whom again I am very close with, have had their fair share of recent experiences as well. Terry's grandmother, though, claims her to be guided by a great spirit and has had the most encounters out of everyone. She says nightly she'll be what she claims is tested among these beings. The angry wolf spirit constantly tries to get into their house, but can never as she keeps everything locked. She refused to mention the name of their version of a skinwalker, but told me they too will pay visits into the night. She explained that there has never been a time where there were multiples of these at her house at one time. It's always been one or the other, or other various creatures. She told me about some of them that are smaller and uglier, and some that are a greenish tint. Others are tall and lanky and dark. This same grandmother also lives on the very far western side of the res, not too far off from Mount Adams, actually. The worst experiences she has been having is with those wolf spirits. There is much dark magic being practiced in the res, she expressed to me. There are many individuals that are in poverty that she won't name in fear of word getting out that they call these beings into the reservation to cause fear to those who don't control the spirits. There's just certain members in the tribe you don't interact with. You don't want to make enemies at all. They are by far the most aggressive evil spirits she has encountered. She usually chants out a prayer to rid them of her house. Other things like burning sage act as a deflection against those kinds of things, but these spirits can cross that boundary. If given the opportunity, these things will kill, and they will do harm. The grandfather, Terry's grandfather, who passed away years ago, had many personal run-ins with these same beings when hunting, mostly during the morning hours and dusk, but I guess he had a large scar running up his thigh and torso from when one of these things attacked him and almost gutted him like a pig. They were a common nuisance to deal with around the nighttime. There were times where he would be out hunting buck for meat, and these things would steal the kill from him, or get to the body before he could. It happened more than once, I was told about. The grandfather only ever got into one physical altercation with one of these things that we know of, and survived. He didn't kill it, but it attacked him and let him be. He tried to stab it, but its hide was so thick, the knife wouldn't penetrate, he said. It was a predator that was meant to be feared. It sounded to me like he and many others know about this kind of being, along with things like skinwalkers and such, but they wouldn't ever mention it or talk about it, or even going as far as acknowledging their existence for the fact that they don't want to draw it in. It's really weird how secret they keep these things. Like I mentioned, they are very strict to the mantra of if you talk about it or give it energy, it will come to you. This grandfather has also had various encounters with the skinwalker as well, but when he was much younger. Those stories I wasn't told. The worst experience of his I was told about was when he was going to fish at a creek, a fishing spot he had found, and this wolf spirit was on the other side of the river, waiting to get to him. He saw the wolf spirit and it chased him. He fled and made it back, but this wolf spirit drove him out of that fishing spot. This was next to the worst time, other than being attacked. A quick note about the grandfather. He ended up dying from cancer years and years ago, so I never got to fully find out all the details to his story. Luckily for me, Terry's grandmother was able to recount to me much of the information I needed. That's about it as much as I basically know about the grandfather. Terry's younger brother, who is in his later 20s, has had some pretty bad ones too. One time, his car was attacked by multiples of these wolf spirits while he was out in the woods driving around. It was nighttime, and they surrounded his vehicle and even bit and popped one of his tires. They were trying to pull him out of the car, clawing at the windows and trying to pull the car door handle. I don't know how he made it back, but he apparently was riding on a partially existing tire, sparks and all. He had even had encounters with these things while he was back in high school. This huge, hairy, wolf-looking beast would watch him walk home every day from the tree line. He would recite his prayers out loud the whole walk to keep it at bay, in fear of it reaching out and trying to grab him and take him away. This was before he knew about these beings, really, but still understood that they were evil. 
They have all had so many similar accounts and experiences. They've all had their fair share of seeing this out at night, by the road, crossing the road, looking into their windows, you name it. Terry's mother has even recalled nights where she would wake up out of fear and terror and have to go stand out on the front porch and chant prayers to ward off this thing's energy and knowing that it was around their house. His mother also talks about when she was younger, being visited by this thing, by this being, when she was alone in her room. Even when she went to friends' houses, this thing was always finding a way to show up. Something I expressed with not only Terry, but his grandmother, mother and brothers, is that from these stories, these wolf spirits have so many opportunities to kill and do far worse. Why don't they? All of them agree and aren't sure. They believe other than the grandmother that these beings are meant to incite fear and torment a person that they are sent after. The grandmother believes that these are much more nefarious beings, and given the right chance, they will kill, even though no one besides the grandfather and the family had gotten physically hurt in any way. I've kindly told them about my findings into cryptozoology, and what these beings, what they are actually describing, are dogmen. They are intrigued, but still hold true to all of their beliefs that this is some demonic spirit coming after them, and it's important to stay away. One thing that has always struck a weird chord with me is there's so much tying together cryptids and Native American culture and shamanism. I am still trying to find the connection myself. I was even told that there are so-called experts on these beings from some of the elders in the tribe, but they won't talk about it, especially to me, a white boy. So I'll just have to keep researching and digging out what I can. As fascinating as all this truly is, it is also simply terrifying that these beings seem to be targeting not just Terry's family, but many families in the tribe and the reservation. If I find out anything more worth writing to you about, I'll write you in. Stay safe. When I was a child, about 10 years old, I used to go huckleberry picking with my grandparents. It was an experience that I greatly cherished, and I did that for years. One summer, it was a very hot August day, where we went up into northern Idaho and picked a huge batch of huckleberries. My grandparents were picking berries, and I ran off into another spot on the other side of the trail we were on to pick more huckleberries. I grabbed my basket, and I start rotating between stuffing my face with berries and putting them in the basket. I hear this loud crack, not far away from me, at about my 8 o'clock and turn around in reaction to the loud crack. I froze and dropped my berry basket, covering my mouth so I didn't scream. I can't judge feet well, so I'm gonna say it was probably 50 feet away from me. There, in the trees, was this really scary looking, shaggy dog on two legs, holding down this lower thick branch like it was plotting to sneak over this branch and get to me. When I turned to see it, it had an expression on its face like, oh shit, I've been caught, kind of look. It had the most intense eyes and stare I've ever seen on a person or an animal. Even at 10 years old, I knew what I was staring at was not an animal. It had too much intelligence in its eyes. It had intent and expression. It was very scary. I thought the way it looked was equally as scary. It was so much bigger than me. It would have dwarfed me had it been next to me. I mean, if this thing wanted to swoop in and grab me and take me away, like it was probably planning to do, it could have done so so easily. Sometimes I'll think back about that branch not making the breaking snap sound that it did. And had it not, I think I would have probably been eaten by this thing. I was a skinny, small, little scrawny kid. So I'm sure this thing saw me as the perfect grab-and-go kind of meal. It quickly retracted back into the trees after staring me in the eyes for a second, and I took that opportunity to run back to my grandparents, crying, telling them exactly what I saw. My grandparents were great people, and both were versed in the wild enough that they each had their own Bigfoot experiences. When I told them about what I saw, they believed me and comforted me. I'm glad because so many grandparents or parents would have just written a kid off who had seen something like that. 
We left the area immediately with my grandparents praying over me. But speaking of my grandmother, my grandmother was known in our community for her wonderful huckleberry pies. They were something from another world. They were so good. Secret recipe that had been passed down in our family. Every August, we'd go up into the mountains of Washington, Oregon, or even Idaho and harvest a large batch. I always loved eating them. So good. Back in the early 80s, I had went fishing with a couple of buddies out in a lake that was adjacent to the Mississippi River. I believe the year was either 84 or 85. This was also near the town of Hughes, not far off from Highway 147. The lay of the land is thick with brush and forest, intermixed with cypress and pine. It's a beautiful wetland area. We were exploring the area and hiking around along the lakes and areas near the large river. It was nearing sundown and we still had a ways to go to get back to where we had come from. We all heard this loud crashing sound near the bank of the river and the thick foliage and undergrowth. We weren't sure if it could have possibly been a stray cow or maybe another fisherman perhaps. All of a sudden, we see this thing that was shaped like a person appear out of the foliage just feet from the edge of the water. It looked just like a dog standing up on two legs. It had thick matted hair and its head was disproportionately large. I still remember those large pointed ears. I don't know why, how, who or what, but by the grace of God Almighty, it didn't notice us, somehow. After maybe a second of appearing out of the foliage, it lifted its head up in the air and sniffed around like just like how a dog does. Then it looked off in the opposite direction we were and jumped full body into the river. All three of us were shocked but amazed by what we had just seen. My one friend kept trying to tell me it was just a bear, but it was definitely canine looking, no doubt about that. From the distance we were at too, I would say it was at least as tall as we were. It even had a thin, tapered waist like a dog, and dog-like legs. It was eerie. I don't think there's any native wild dogs that walk upright in this area, but I guess I'm wrong. I know I've heard people talk about strange things that happen near the river and in the woods, but I always just thought it was more hoaxes and BSing. Anyway, the entirety of the encounter lasted maybe 20 seconds in total. I feel like that's being pretty gracious, maybe more like 10 to 15 seconds. I should state that we didn't smell anything unusual in that moment or before or after the incident. Never got any weird feelings, experienced anything weird or anything unusual. It was just when we heard that crashing sound that we saw this thing. We were about 100 plus feet away from it, but where it was at, we had a clear as day view of this thing. Even in dusk, there was enough light to make out vivid details. June 2000. I had been up all night at a friend's house in the town of Tribby playing video games. I didn't want to sleep there, so I said goodbye and headed home. I knew my car was making a funny noise, but I thought surely I could get home. Well, I was driving down a long, dark stretch of highway with nothing but forest and a few sparse country houses. I was coming up to the top of a long hill when suddenly my car stops pulling forward. The engine revved, but no gears would engage. My CV joint just went out. I was hoping that wouldn't happen. Well, I had no way of getting it home, so I backed down, down the road, in neutral, and off onto a side road. I thought about staying and sleeping in the car, but something told me not to do that. I had an eerie feeling of being watched, so I grabbed my video game case and my machete that I had made from a lawnmower blade and started walking. I kept noticing the feeling of being watched, and it felt like I was being followed. I kept looking behind me and saw nothing, but when a car passed by, heading in the direction behind me, it illuminated the area when its headlights and I saw something behind me and the ditch hunched down low. It was huge and I could tell it looked animal but had very humanoid features. It seemed to have arms but its head was most definitely canine. Its head was very large and its eyes glowed red when the lights hit them. 
Well, I've seen enough werewolf movies to know that this wasn't a good situation, so I started running. That probably wasn't the best choice because I know that predators like to chase things that run for them. When the car had passed, the creature had darted into the trees. I thought that was the best time to run, so I did. I ran for about a quarter mile and looked back but didn't see anything, so I kept walking. Well, I kept checking behind me and off to the side where the tree line was. I knew it was still out there and probably following me. And yeah, I was afraid, but I was also prepared to defend myself with my machete, if need be. I came up onto another hill and saw a farmhouse off in the distance to my left, down a long dirt driveway. The moon was almost full and the area around the house was clear, so I could see a guy out there messing with his truck as I walked by. Then, he turned on a spotlight on his truck and spotted me with it. I kept walking because his property said no trespassing and many out there wouldn't hesitate to unload on a strange trespasser. I knew it was close again, possibly closer now, and it was about to turn around and face it when another car came over the top of the hill and passed by me, going behind me again. I followed with my eyes and noticed this time it was a cop. So thinking quickly, I dropped my machete on the edge of the grass and waved. As he passed, his lights hit the ditch as well, and I saw the dogman was very close, but it darted into the trees again when the light hit it. Thankfully, a moment later, the cop had stopped and turned around. He came back and asked me what I was doing out there, so I told him what had happened with my car. I didn't mention the dogman, though. He may have thought I was crazy, but... I asked him for a ride home. He agreed after wanting to go check and make sure my car wasn't blocking the road. After we checked it, he agreed to take me home. I don't know what might have happened that night if he hadn't shown up, and it was the only time I was genuinely happy to ever see a police officer. July 1st, 2014. I was on patrol as a deputy sheriff for the county and was usually assigned to the Highway 13 and Highway 30 corridors. However, I recall that particular July 1st, however, that a young man, 16 or 17 years old, had been sucked into a storm drain, which emptied into Cedar Lake near the Quaker Oats plant. This is a place with heavy foot traffic and located in an urban setting. The area is also bordered by Mohawk Park. As the search went on into the night, the local PD got the county involved. I parked my cruiser at what I believe was the electric company's storage yard. The yard had what I estimated to be a 10-foot fence that ran parallel to a paved bike trail on the other side which runs a large concrete spillway to siphon off floodwaters. I arrived at what I estimate to be roughly 11.30 p.m. to approximately 11.45 p.m. I estimate only because I assure you there never was, nor will be, an official statement or record with my name on it telling this story. As I left the lot, I was at the north end of the lake and headed west on foot. There was a lot of brush and saplings between the spillway and the trail, so I proceeded onto the point of the trail that turns south near where Cedar Lake empties into the Cedar River. This is all under the railroad tracks leading into the Quaker Oats. There are multiple tracks at the turn I mentioned before, and the only track furthest from myself had a train on it. With my attention on the spillway, I hardly noticed at first a faint red-colored light, a distance north from my position. It was coming down the track on the other side of the train. I thought it perhaps the trail lights of a car. Not being that patrol route, I had no knowledge that there was, in fact, no road in that direction. There ain't much things in the world that scare me, Put simply, I've seen some things in my days, but nothing prepared me for that night. The lights disappeared, and that was that, or so I figured. About five minutes passed before I hear a snorting, almost sniffing sound coming from the other side of the tracks. When I turned, the first thing I saw were the eyes. They glowed a dull red. The thing was at least eight foot tall, pushing 450. I judge this by the fact that I am 6'4", and weigh 280 pounds. I turned my light, and to this day, I wish I hadn't. 
It had pointed ears and a long muzzle, and it looked me right in the face before it bolted into the timber. It was not a mask, and it was not a person in a costume. Who would walk up on an armed man with a police radio in full uniform and risk getting shot? I remember it was so surreal, so final, I guess. I know it's in the dark now. People can say or think what they want, but even with a chambered round and a full magazine and a Glock 40, didn't feel like enough firepower. I unholstered and fell back toward the trail and to the electric company storage yard, putting the fence to my back. I made a hasty retreat to a lot with my cruiser. I don't think I holstered my pistol till I got out of the park. I never spoke of it then and honestly don't know why I am now, but one thing is for certain, it knew I was there and it was watching my every move. I'll never go back and I no longer work with the department since becoming a minister, but I still carry a Glock with hollow point rounds tipped with silver if, and I rarely do, leave my home at night. August was 17 years old at the time. My dad and mom had taken my little brother and sister to Tucson to do something for the day. We lived in a trailer in a rural area outside of Sierra Vista. We had two horses, two dogs, a cow, and some chickens on the small amount of land we had. As the eldest son, it was my job to feed and take care of them. On the night in question, it was a stormy monsoon rain with thunder and lightning going on. But like monsoons can be, they rage and then settle into the lull and rage again. I was getting ready to settle down and watch a good movie when all of a sudden, my two dogs start barking and wouldn't shut up. When I told them to calm down, in fact. In the previous week or so before, my dogs had been acting up and barking a lot at night. I just attributed this to coyotes that I'd heard howling in the night. So I got my dad's rifle and just one bullet in case I had to shoot to scare off the coyote or kill it if rabid. I rested the loaded rifle near the wall by the back door and turned on the floodlights outside the trailer. The rain had just stopped, so I looked out by the window near the front door and saw our two horses and cow staring as if through the front door to the back door of the trailer where the dogs were barking. I thought, maybe they're scared of the coyotes. So I grabbed the rifle and opened up the back door. As I was getting near the back door, I heard my dogs whimpering and crying. Now I was thinking, could it be a pack of coyotes? So I put a few bullets in my pocket, figuring I could load them if I didn't like what I saw. I opened the door and the darnest thing happened. My two dogs beeline rushed past me to the center of the trailer and hunkered down right in the kitchen. Mud is everywhere on the floor from their paws and I'm pissed because I have to clean it up now. So I close the door and go to try to get my dogs to get out, but they wouldn't budge and squirmed out of my arms when I tried to grab them. They were terrified. Now I was mad at the coyotes and grabbed the rifle to go run them off or kill them. The trailer sits on a foundation of blocks. The front and back doors are accessible by a small set of small stairs. I'm 5'6", by the way. I opened the back door and was looking out in the darkness. At that point, I was about to step out when I saw a set of eyes looking back at me out of the darkness. From the top of my head in the trailer to the ground is around seven plus feet or so. And here is a set of eyes looking at me, level and square on. I'm like, darn, Coyote must be on a small gravel hill. We used to pave the road, or it's a bird on a mesquite bush. But I was thinking to myself, what monsoon was awfully bad and rained hard? What kind of bird would hunker down on a mesquite bush? And why would a coyote be out in a downpour? So I'm raising my rifle and drawing a bead on the eyes when lightning lights up the night. All of a sudden, the lightning illuminates a small gravel hill that's like six feet high and the surrounding mesquite bushes. The light winks out as fast as it appeared from the lightning though. There was nothing on the gravel hill and no bird on any of the mesquite bushes. Then it dawned on me. 
Whatever it was, it was very tall and was still staring at me. A sense of dread crept over me all of a sudden, as I realized that the rifle had only one measly bullet, and if I missed, there was no way I'd be able to reload in time before this thing, whatever it was, was on me. I kept the gun pointed at it as I quickly closed the door. I locked the door, realizing this trailer would never withstand whatever it was that was out there if it attacked. I locked the front door and turned on all of the lights in the house. I grabbed all the bullets, the 30 odd six and the 22 rifle, and then got in the kitchen with the dogs and I loaded each rifle full on. I hugged my dogs and prayed that whatever it was went away and didn't attack. I stayed awake that whole night until my parents got back. My dad was furious that all the lights were on. My dad checked outside though for coyotes, but Whatever it was, was gone. Some say Skinwalker, but I think otherwise. I wanted to tell you about some interesting stories my friend told me about a part of the Yakima Reservation. I should give you some pre-information first. I live in eastern Washington, north of Yakima. The Yakima Reservation is a fairly small reservation, but borders from Yakima up to one side of Mount Adams. That alone is so interesting because of all the stuff that happens around that mountain, but I'll get to that in a minute. I feel confident in my wisdom and research of what I know about cryptids and such that I'm an avid researcher. I'm talking about Bigfoot, Skinwalkers, Chupacabra, Jersey Devil, Dogmen, Wendigos, you name it. So for me to have a friend who's a native and very much into his traditional side of things is a godsend. They too usually have their own stories and experiences with similar beings and things of the unknown. They are usually very spiritual people, very traditional and by the roots, so to speak. Well, at least some of them are. Many of my friends are natives and from that same reservation, as well as their families. These are very traditional people, like I said, and what you can learn from them and their experiences is just breathtaking. Now, my close friend, he doesn't want me to mention his real name, even though I have his permission to tell these stories to you. We'll call him Terry. Terry grew up on the res his whole life and was very enriched in the tradition, language, and experiences and has some incredible encounters himself along the way. Him and I both share an interest in the unknown, paranormal, and cryptids. However, he's scared beyond his wits when he has an experience or encounters. He firmly believes we weren't meant to come into contact with beings like this. They are far beyond our human level of comprehension, which is how he describes it. Terry, whom I've gotten to be close with many of his family, all have very similar experiences and things happen to them in their life too. I've talked with him and his family about skinwalkers, if that's a thing up here in Washington, like I know it is down in Arizona. They do have similar stories, but they have a word for it that I can't quite remember what it was. I'll have to ask Terry again. It's one of those things they don't really like to bring up, because even mentioning them, more so during the night, is like calling out to these beings. Most of his immediate family was very hesitant to even talk about it, but here and there they would. Terry, though, has experienced something that isn't quite Skinwalker-like, and much more beastly, he likes to say. The first real experience he had when he explained that this large angry looking wolf that stood on two legs was stalking him and his brother out on a river one day fishing. He said it scared them so bad that they never went back to that same fishing spot. He's had a couple of friends mention that they've seen it driving at night, running across the road or even watching them as they drive by. The next time he would have an encounter was with it when he was a little older and at a friend's house having a bonfire late at night. Him and his friends saw these large red eyes coming toward them from the tree line and a large silhouette of a tall wolf. He's seen it walking along the side of the road at nighttime, partially hidden by the tall grass. He's also had it stalk around his house before at night, trying to open all the door handles to get in and roaring loudly outside. The reservation police know about them and won't and refuse to deal with them. 
I guess his little brothers used to collect certain charms, and these charms would somehow draw these beings in more and more until Terry himself realized that what they were doing and made them get rid of them. As soon as that happened, they stopped coming around as much, but he would still see them from time to time. He won't tell me the kind of charms they are in fear that I will go and seek out similar ones. They got them on the reservation. That much I do know. I believe it might have been something to do with black magic, as that's kind of what he hinted towards. I'm not 100% sure about myself. He has told me stories I'm not 100% sure myself. He has told me stories about people who he has known growing up and how they play around with spirits of the dark and light. Says there are times when the spirits get drawn into the area. You'll know it too because you can feel it in the air. It feels tense. He says there are other evil beings besides just what he has seen, which is what I think is a dogman based on his descriptions. He's told me about his friends seeing tall skinny ones that are dark in color and short ones too. They only come out in the middle of the night and are just as equally frightening. I haven't heard anything about anyone being physically hurt. Even the stories I've been told about being tormented by these or other beings, it's just more terrorizing than it is harming. It's as if these beings are seeking this out, to scare and to terrorize the people they target. The other thing is that these beings, not just the one he's been seeing, but all of them seem to target a specific person. It's almost as if they're assigned to an individual or individuals. I've asked him if what he's seeing is a skinwalker, and he has knowledge on skinwalkers, but he knows them mainly from the Navajo religion and culture. But like he said, they do have similar beings up here with just different names. He tells me he really does not believe this being to be a skinwalker. He says it's a being of darkness, is how he describes it. But it is not the same being. He says it's the spirit of an evil wolf in the form of flesh. Him and his brothers and friends know about it and stay at certain spots in the woods. This includes hunting spots, fishing spots, shortcuts in the trails, game trails, things like that. There's certain areas they will only go during the day and avoid at night. They treat it very seriously. One thing I wanted to mention to you was that I said earlier it's interesting how the western part of the reservation ends on half of Mount Adams. This mountain has been notorious over the years for strange sightings of weird things, unexplainable things. Bigfoots have been spotted here countless times, even dating back to the 1800s. Washington State's history is rich with them. There's also talk about time and dimensional anomalies. Those stories are pretty interesting too. Of course, there's UFO sightings as well. There seems to be some sort of abnormal magnetic reading in certain spots along the mountain itself. I'm not sure how that ties in with everything, but it is interesting once you try to connect the dots. I will say that I think it has something to do with these beings showing up and having so many sightings. I know some of his other friends live closer to the mountain, and they talk about seeing this thing more often than not. Maybe it's drawn to a certain area more than others. From what I've gathered that he's told me is that the farthest east you go on the res, the less there are. I'll talk to more of his family and friends and see if I can't get some more stories for you, because it's very interesting. Maybe he is indeed seeing a dogman, and these beings are somehow attracted to him for whatever reason. I'll write back to you when I get a chance to actually talk to his family and friends more. Late summer, back in 2009, I was visiting family that lived outside of Memphis in the evening time. I was driving in the truck with my brothers and cousins from my dad's side of the family. We were heading to their property to go feed the horses and livestock. It was a longer drive. We ended up having to take a small dirt road that went quite a ways off the main road for quite some distance. Just like out of a horror movie, my brothers get a call from their mom who's at the house to just see where they were. They got her on speakerphone and they're having casual conversation for the most part. Then they start talking about how the horses have acted really spooked all day long and are acting strange. My brothers say that they have noticed that too and they're not sure why since that hardly ever happens. I kid you not, not even a couple minutes later, 
this freak of nature looking dog thing steps out across the road, looks at our vehicle, and quickly darts into the woods. All of us were screaming, did you see that? My stepmom was still on the phone with my brothers and we're all freaking out. Whatever it was had long brown shaggy hair, a massive dog head with lots of teeth and huge claws on its hands. I distinctly remember it tucking its arms and hands up to its body like a T-Rex does when it ran across the road. I also vividly recall it having long 12 inch black claws off each of its fingertips. For whatever reason, my eyes went right to its hands. Maybe because it looked so terrifying. The hands reminded me a lot of raccoon hands actually, just with really long large claws. I briefly saw the face but it happened so fast I think I just spent more time taking it all in. After more freaking out and trying to make sense of it, I almost wonder if that's what had caused the horses to act up. They only lived a couple of miles away from the spot we saw this thing. They had been acting up all morning long and then that happened in the evening. When it crossed the road, it seemed to come from the general direction of our house so I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. I have truly no idea though. I do remember that evening, the horses seemed to be a little more calmed down, and the following day they were okay. I don't think any of us could really put a finger on exactly what it was we saw, but my brothers say it was an alien dog or something. It just looked like a big upright hairy wolf dog. I've thought about the whole werewolf thing too, but I don't know. Werewolves are usually painted in a much more human-like light than this thing was. It was just full on wild animal. You could tell by the way it looked and moved. Very humanoid looking, but like a wild beast. I do recall seeing its hair blowing a little bit in the wind as it dove across the road after seeing us. From what I can remember about seeing the body, it was very lean. There were muscles rippling by where its front of its body was, like the chest and stomach. I remember that. I know for a fact that this was not a bear, wolf, regular dog, coyote, nothing that I've ever seen before. That's the weirdest thing. Even though it looked very dog-like, it didn't look exactly like just a dog standing there. Like I said, it was very humanoid and looked like its own being. Its face from what I remember was more wolf-like in appearance but still very dog-like. I want to say that I'm being honest and sharing this sensitive information. I know there's a lot of people I could just openly tell this story to because I would be mocked and criticized for such things. I'm here to tell you there are things beyond our imagination that we don't know about living out there. I was a pretty big skeptic of things too that I didn't normally or couldn't normally see with my own eyes. I used to believe that if there were any unknown species of anything living in North America, especially the woods, we would know by now due to our dense population and at technology of exploration. I guess I was wrong and can happily admit that. I was on a cross country trip with my 13 year old son some years back. We were headed to a hotel and were currently in Arkansas at the time. It was nighttime and we were lost and both of our phones were dead so we were kind of just driving around aimlessly. I can't tell you the exact road we were on because I don't remember. I can tell you we were somewhere close to Highway 27 as that is the last road I remember. I also remember us being on a two lane highway and my son complaining that he had to pee real bad so we pulled over. There is thick forest around us and especially where I pulled off to so I figured it would be the perfect spot for him to run up into the trees and relieve himself. Using his phone as a flashlight. He wandered off about 20 feet just into the tree line. I'm sitting there in the car checking my phone to see if I can get anything and I hear what sounds like footsteps sprinting to my car. I turn my head to look over and my son's frantically opening the door jumping in and screaming at me to go go go. He's yelling and being crazy and I'm trying to calmly talk to him and figure out what just happened and he starts getting really emotional and begging me to go and not explaining anything. This was out of character for my son. He never acted like this. My son by nature is very quiet and collective. He's a good boy and he's been out with me on all sorts of adventures. 
He's definitely not a scaredy cat. In fact, when he was younger, he's the one who decided to stick his whole arm in an ant mound, but that's a different story. Something spooked him this time so bad that he was totally acting weird. So I pulled out of there and we're driving down the road and I'm trying to figure out if he even got to use the bathroom. He doesn't even acknowledge the question and instead just tells me there was a big wolf that he had ran into in the tree line. What? When I asked him, what do you mean wolf? He said this thing was the size of a grizzly bear and standing on two legs. He said it stuck its hand out to try and grab him, but ended up turning around and ran back to the car just in time. The scariest thing he told me is dad, I'm 13 and I don't believe in monsters, but that was a real life monster. I know many parents would blow their child off and tell them they probably just saw something that spooked them. I've raised my son to be very logical and analytical. I teach him to question everything and I believe my son saw something because I even try to reassure him that maybe in the poor lighting, it was just a bear. He explains to me that because he was so close to this thing, he got a good look at it, or at least enough of a look at it, and said, their bears don't have teeth like this, dad. Of course, this was years ago, and he is now 20. We just recently brought up this event again in conversation, and he goes, dad, I guess what I seen that night is what they call a dog man. I guess they are all over America, and I happen to see one. I asked him if they are like werewolves, and he said no, that they are just upright walking canine cryptids. I'm not too sure what I think about the whole thing, but it is interesting, and I thought you would like me to share it with you. Hello, my name is Richard, and I'm a cryptid researcher. I've been doing this for the past 12 years now, and I'm trying to branch out in the community and share more of my experiences and stories from many eyewitnesses I've interviewed and talked to. I'm always out digging and trying to gather and collect more information. I have a ton of dogman stories to share with you from eyewitnesses that I've spoken to over the years. I haven't really shared much of these because I truly felt that I just hadn't found the right YouTuber or person to release them through quite yet. I think you'll do better with some of these stories than others will. One of the more recent stories I wanted to share with you was when I interviewed this older gentleman who had lived and resided in West Virginia all of his life. He was a native, but I can't remember the tribe that he belonged to. He told me a story of how one of these dog beasts of the swamp came and took his brother when they were both very young. This older gentleman was in his 70s, and his brother was only three years younger than him. He was 12 at the time, and his younger brother was 9. He was out playing in the woods when the beast, as this older man describes, came out of the woods and grabbed onto his brother and carried him away deeper into the forest. This man immediately told his family, and the family told the elders about the boy being grabbed. They sent some of their own men of the tribe to go into the deep part of the woods to track down his brother, but they never found any trace of him. They gave up hope after a few days, knowing that he was probably gone for good. He never did come back, and that's something that has changed him forever, even as a younger boy. From my own research, I haven't came across anything along the lines of anyone being captured or kidnapped or taken by these things. But who's to say that can't be a thing? This older man showed me some of the relics and totems their tribe used to ward these beings and other foul spirits away. He recited me some prayers that he grew up praying with to keep his tribe and family safe. He did not have much to say about other matters like what this beast looked like exactly when it happened. I could tell it was still hard for him to talk about, so I didn't press the issue too much. The one takeaway I got from this gentleman was that his tribe had numerous run-ins with these beasts stealing supplies and children from their villages. His brother was not the first or only young child to be taken by these same creatures. I've noticed other similar patterns and behavior by the Sasquatch in Northern California. The local tribes of the land refer to a Sasquatch as mountain devils and they would come into these villages during the night and kidnap children and women. 
So to hear almost the same thing is happening on the opposite end of the coast by a completely different cryptid is simply fascinating. It tells us these creatures truly do act in a similar way, and maybe they are tied together in one way or another. As you'll know, Bigfoot and Dogman don't like each other for some reason. There always seems to be situations where Bigfoot will come into an area that Dogman aren't, and as soon as Dogman arrive in the area, the Bigfoot will be gone. There are a few tales passed down if you get a chance to talk to the right tribesmen about these beings fighting. There was a scarce amount of written record of this happening for certain villages. I believe these beings fought over territory. That's my conclusion at least. The fellow in which I've been speaking about told me it's because they were fighting over food supply, between children, deer, and all other wildlife out in the swamp and surrounding lands. It all provided ample food and cover for these cryptids. This being or these beings were known about long before his brother was ever taken, and even he knew about it, but had never actually seen one in the flesh. He knew many people in his tribe, and still do, that have had multiple run-ins with these things. Mostly in the swamp, that's where they like to hunt and live, he had told me. Even his grandfather and the village elders when he was a boy had forewarned about the beasts and shared their own tales of encountering both beasts fighting or just running into one another. It was when they would go out to hunt to seek food. Sometimes the dogmen would learn the behaviors of the villagers when they had soldiers patrolling to know when to sneak in and not be seen. These are very intelligent beings, and even he agreed with me on that. They are not to be underestimated. That's why when you're outside of the village getting supplies, wood, water, or anything and you're by yourself, you need to be aware of where you are and where you were going. There were just certain spots you wouldn't go to or visit because you could feel their presence around you and you knew you didn't have long or else you would be taken too. There were many of these areas, but mostly a mile or more out into the swamp. They had lost several of their own village people from those who had wandered too far out in the name of exploration or supplies and never returned. These things thrive in the swamps from what I've gathered, which to me is surprising because there are so many dogman encounters that happen in places that aren't necessarily swampy or are far more desert-like. I guess dogmen can really be found anywhere, from dense, lushed forests to suburban areas as we've all seen and heard encounters there, even swamps. This email could go on forever, so I'll stop and just share this one story with you for now. I'll be sending you many more for you and your audience to enjoy. Thanks. I wanted to write to you because what I believe is that I had an encounter with a werewolf. I have no idea what else to call this thing that I saw. My dog sure reacted funny to it too, and my dog is a very well-behaved animal. It happened when I would go on evening runs with my dog in the summertime, since it starts to really cool down in the evening. It was really a night just like any other night where I ran my dog, headphones in and all. I don't run anywhere sketchy, just around my neighborhood. There are lots of trees, but no forests or anything. You're a pretty standard run-of-the-mill kind of neighborhood. I first noticed things were off because my dogs, well, they started acting strange. She began cowering at points throughout the run and stopped to where I'd have to tug on her leash to get her to go. I thought the whole thing was so strange. Then as we're coming around the curve in the sidewalk, this werewolf steps out behind us. I'm running forward, hear something heavy step out from behind me, and I turn my head. My dog is already going crazy, and there's just this thing standing there. It was clear as day that you had somebody who was 8 feet tall get into a high-quality, ultra-realistic werewolf costume. It just stood there, out in the open, watching me run. I was in such shock. I knew it wasn't somebody in a costume. It felt real. It looked real. My mind just went blank because I couldn't fathom such an animal to be in the flesh only 10 feet behind me. My legs didn't stop moving though. I kept on running, even though I'm somehow dragging my dog with me. 
Time itself slowed down, and I think I might have even blacked out a lot of it. It's like I got PTSD from it or something. I must have kept running, but my head turned, keeping a close eye on this thing. A mix between, what the fuck is that, and oh my god is this even real. It never moved, it never tried to reach out and grab me, or even touch me. It easily could have. It was within arm's reach of me, and it just stopped, and I ran until it was out of sight. I cut the run short, got home, and went on full house lockdown for three days after that. My dog wouldn't stop shaking and acting strange. In the next weeks, after I had horrible nightmares about this thing being outside my house and coming in to get me, I kept it at bay for only so long, but it didn't fully stop. It was all just really creepy. I didn't run for almost a month after the initial encounter. When I started again, I never ran the same route I did on that one evening where I ran into the creature. July 2nd, 2015 While scanning the valley floor for sheep a mile from my house, I noticed two loping figures. Initially, I just thought the figures were coyotes or stray dogs, but as the two figures neared an old sunken vehicle, I realized that the things were about the size of the vehicle itself, nearly eight feet long. No animal could be that big on the res. I watched the two figures until they disappeared in the woods across the valley. It was starting to get dark, but the moon was bright enough, so I walked without a light. As I walked down the mountain, I heard something yelling. It was like a howl or a yell. I started to hurry. Then, when I got to my house, I locked the door and spent the night listening to the strangest sounds. I'm sure it was a skinwalker, but I found this and was surprised at what I saw. Eight years ago, my brother John was heading home from his girlfriend's house off a country road outside of Boulder, 11 miles south of Pinedale, Wyoming. It was around 1 or 2 a.m. when he saw what he said was a huge dog traversing down the slope of the south side of the road and commencing to run alongside his pickup. He was driving a 6970 Ford F-150 High Boy, which came from the factory lifted. The dogman was running with him at around 40 miles an hour. There is a two to three foot barrow ditch running along the road and the dogman's head was level with his as he was driving. So John puts its height at around seven to eight feet. It was dark in color with gray or white on its muzzle running from its nose to under its eyes which were amber in color. He sped up to 45 and then the dogman kept up with him often looking inside the pickup he said at around 50 miles an hour, he lost it, and that's really all he would ever tell me. August 15th, 2004. I'm probably the youngest person to come to you about this. I'm 16, I grew up here in Montana, and am very active in the outdoors. When I was four or five, I lived with my parents in a small town next to the highway. Our house was right next to it, and my room faced a gravel road that went into the highway. It was summer, and we didn't have AC, so I would leave my window open at night so I could stay cool. One night, I woke up and noticed a silhouette standing outside my window. My eyes focused, and I saw that it had a furry outline, and those frost blue eyes it was using to look up at me. I sat up in my bed, frightened, but I didn't feel the need to yell for my parents or anything. It just kind of stared at me. While looking at it, I saw that it had pointed ears with tufts of fur, like a lynx, and a muzzle like a German Shepherd. It was fairly muscular, and was almost resting on my windowsill, like it was leaning up against it. We stared at each other for a good couple of minutes, then it smiled at me, like a dog does, even tilted its head. It then backed away from the window, walked across my yard to our chain link fence, and literally stepped over it. I got out of bed to watch this thing as it got down on all fours and ran down the road and across the highway. Listening, I heard it yip and bark while on the other side, which was a prairie, when a butte and then forest. It was almost like it was calling to others. Looking back on this, I feel like maybe it felt like it didn't pose a threat. Maybe it was just curious. 
Back then, I was just a little kid. Now, I'm a lot bigger. I'm 6'7 and weigh almost 200 pounds. So, I'm thinking if I saw one of these again, I probably wouldn't get the same reaction. On April 4th of 2018, I came back home from work around midnight. Like most nights, I sat down on my back porch and lit a cigarette and relaxed. However, unlike most nights, I heard something new. I'm used to coyotes and my neighbor's dogs barking, but in this case, I heard something different. It sounded like a deep howl, but instead of the usual dog sound, it stayed as one tone, and it was octaves deeper. I heard it go from the backyard to backyard, and then the neighbor's dogs started to take notice. The dog's barking triggered one of my dogs to run out to the fence line, and she began to bark at something unseen, at least from my perspective. I got up and I told her, Hey, come back in girl, it's okay. She turned to me, and she sat there utterly frozen in fear. It took a few minutes to break her out of this, and she bolted to the back of the door. I decided to poke my head out of the gate and look into the field behind the fence. By the tree line, I saw these amber-colored eyes standing about five feet above the ground. I decided to run in and took up my knife and ran out in the direction of the eyes. The whole time, I walked that I heard the growls and the howls. However, though when I got close to where I initially saw these eyes, every sound stopped. You could literally hear a pin drop. Where I didn't see anything, I felt the presence of something watching me. After a few moments, I walked back to the porch and sat and had another smoke. It was then the howls started again. This time, though, they came from my neighbor's backyard. They have two shepherds, and I will never forget the sound. I first heard this guttural growl noise, unlike anything I've ever heard before. Then, one of the shepherds shrieked, and then I heard the other get slammed against a fence. One thing led to another, and I heard my neighbor fire off a round, and then I heard this thing trail off. The next encounter was just three nights ago. I heard the howl start up again, but this time, I heard it making its way through the tree line behind the back lot of my house. I heard the thumping of its feet, and the branches were snapping. Initially, my instincts kicked in to get to go cover, so I shut off the back porch light and allowed my eyes to get adjusted. There was enough light to clearly see the opening in the tree line that's about two of me wide and about nine and a half feet tall. I watched in the direction where the noises were coming from, and then all of a sudden, I see it. I see it stand up. I first saw the ears, tall and sharp like knives. I then saw its head, followed by its broad shoulders and long arms. It stood there watching me, for what seemed like forever, until it turned and ducked down a little, and took massive strides on two legs to walk off. It's because of this that I've been conducting an investigation on this thing. I learned there was an encounter in Firestone County, not very far from me. I hope to get reasonable evidence here soon. About 28 years ago, I knew an Apache woman who attended the same congregation I did, who told me about a pack of werewolves that she saw when she was a little girl on a Native American reservation in Arizona. She was a really nice person, a devout follower of Jesus, very honest, so her story was very credible to me. Here is what happened. One day, she went with her father to go visit another town on the res that was a few hours away. She said that because they had left late in the day, he decided they would stay in town for the night, since it was getting dark and he didn't want to drive at night. So, he made a warm, comfortable bed for her in the bed of their pickup truck with some blankets they had in the truck. She said at some point, early in the morning, around 3 a.m., she woke up to hear shuffling, grunting and growling near the truck. She said from where she was under all the blankets, she could see them. A group of werewolves that were between seven and eight feet tall, covered with hair. She said they looked like the werewolf from the movie The Howling. 
Growing up on the res, she had heard the stories of Native American shamans who could shapeshift into these hideous creatures by opening themselves up to evil spirits. But now, in shock and terror, she was looking at them. She said she doesn't know if they were unaware that she was in the bed of the truck, or if they knew, but ignored her, but since she didn't move a muscle until they were gone. Many years reflecting on it, she was convinced that either way, the reason they didn't snatch her was that God was protecting her from them. My girlfriend and I have been spending the last couple of summers in my parents' old stone house, which happens to be in the middle of the woods, but somehow equipped with all what one would need for a comfortable lifestyle. To give a little bit of an overview of what it's like on the inside, there is a front entrance leading up to a large living area equipped with a bar and many other means of luxury, such as a cinema screen and a massive freezer for snacks and such. Then to the right, there are stairs leading to the main bedrooms, and to the left, there is a massive sliding glass door leading to the backyard and out into some more woods. With the slight inconvenience of the electricity generator slacking off every once in a while, timing at about six to seven hours in between every crash, and when it does, we'd have to go outside in no matter the time of day to turn it back on as everything and the house relies on electricity to run. One cold summer night, my girlfriend and I were about to fall asleep watching some random show on the TV when the power cut suddenly. Now one thing I should mention is that right before we'd gotten ready to sleep, we got out just to turn it off and back on so we don't have to do it in the middle of the night. Frustrated and having no choice but to get up and seek a fix for it, my girlfriend and I walked outside, embraced by the cold dark night, and out to the back of the house where the generator had been. However, from the moment I'd stood facing the sliding glass door and looked out the woods, my heart sank into the floor with an eerie feeling. Somehow, I felt like I was a little bunny, obliviously walking into a poorly prepared trap but I'd mustered the courage to go outside and be embraced by the dark night. Right as we reached the generator, I'd realized I had forgotten the flashlight while trying to unlock the door, to which my girlfriend suggested I run and fetch it while she waits, which I agreed to, my body craving sleep and the comfort of the house. I ran back on the familiar path, a feeling of dread growing in the pit of my stomach as I neared the house and run as I faced the massive glass door, I realized why. There was someone, or something, standing right in the center of the living area. It had the features of a stray dog, eyes beaming with red, and foam, what seemed to be leaking from its mouth, as it growled aggressively at me. But it was the farthest thing from being a dog. It was standing on two legs, and twice the size of a fairly intimidating man. I froze, my body and exhausted mind teaming up to nail me to the ground as this creature got near me in a zombie-like walk, trying to balance on its own two feet. I felt the hairs on my neck rise as it walked closer to me, sniffing the air around me like a starving dog, hungrily waiting for their next meal. The fear rising until it clicked in my head and something just told me to make a run for it. I ran as fast as I could to get to my girlfriend's, and out of breath, I tried to explain to her why I was so desperate to distance us from the house before I saw the colors be drained from her face as she stared out into the void behind me. She snatched my arm, and we just ran into the woods, hearing as this creature neared us, feeling as if its paws were seconds from collapsing with my feet. I don't know what I feared most, looking behind and having it devour my face, or freezing out of fear as I did earlier. Choosing not to look around, I shouted to my girlfriend to run back around the house, which was a close distance from where we were. Fueled by the fear and sound of the approaching creature, we ran inside and locked the door as I noticed the beast had stopped at the front gate. Puzzled by its strange behavior, my girlfriend and I failed to take in a second of sleep as we listened carefully to its growling and walking around the property like it was playing some sort of sick game. And somehow, 
The hour stretched to years as we waited there for the sun to rise. As soon as the sun rose and we noticed the path to the truck was clear, we hightailed it out of that house and promised to never go back there. Although no one really believes the story, as even we don't quite know what we had encountered that night, I suppose the name Dogman rings well on it. So, needless to say, I'm never going back to that place, so I hope I can stay as far away from it as I can. For starters, I live up a tall mountain grade. Long, slender, winding roads for about seven miles. Just a small guardrail on the same side of the road. Very steep incline going up, with grass, lots of rocks, and the occasional deer. One night, I was driving up it, and the moon was out in full, so the valley and the mountainside and everything was fully lit up. To my left, I saw this large black mass heading right towards the road down the hill. It was moving quick, almost gliding. I start to slow down in anticipation because maybe it's a big deer or a bear, but then this thing jumps into the road and then jumps over the guardrail to the right of me, further down the mountain. I only saw it for a second, but it scared the hell out of me, and I knew it wasn't natural. When it jumped out into the middle of the road, it landed directly in front of my headlights, so it was fully illuminated for just a second before it jumped over the guardrail. It was a large gray-black timber wolf, the largest wolf I'd ever seen, and it moved with incredible speed. The thing that bothered me the most was as it was racing down the mountainside so quickly, that it was so steep, so I don't know how it managed to do that without tumbling forward. Like I said, even its movements looked off. It looked to be gliding rather than running and I'm not sure how it could do that with moving its limbs. I caught the glimpse of this shape about three seconds before it came in contact with the road. I didn't know we had wolves like that out here. I just listened to one of your Dogman videos you made a while back. It was the one where the guy had grandparents that owned a large farm, and the grandfather would have to start sacrificing his cattle and livestock by tying them up on the far side of the farm to keep these dogmen at bay. My grandparents owned a big ranch in California that they would do very similar things. I don't remember much about it because I was younger, but I do remember my grandparents every week or so. Well, maybe it was more than that, but I know it was often. They would take one of their cattle and take it out to a very specific spot far into the backwoods on my grandparents' ranch and leave them there, only one at a time, they would disappear and be gone. My grandfather would do this often and he would alternate between cattle, pigs, goats, whatever he could find. He was constantly getting new livestock and I never knew why at the time. Come to find out when I was older and he had a couple of drinks and loosened up that he'd been dealing with a predator problem that was much worse than a mountain lion or a coyote. That these animals were coming in and taking his cattle and other livestock whole. He would never tell me what it was. I remember asking him, and he still wouldn't tell me. He just explained to me that it was stuff of nightmares, and things a young boy like me at the time should never see. I had no idea what that meant. This is why they sacrificed their livestock to ensure their other livestock stayed alive. I still remember that conversation well, even when I was 15. Grandfather and grandmother passed just about four to five years after that, both having massive heart attacks due to being heavy smokers. That was pretty much that. And then I heard in that episode you released and I connected the dots. I had no idea there were other farmers out there that have to do the same stuff. I couldn't tell you if he had heard any howls or seen anything weird, but my grandfather acted strange when we would talk about it. A kind of strange where you know somebody knows something that bothers them, but they won't tell you what it is. That episode makes sense to me, and I'm sure that's what it could have been. Gosh, just thinking about it makes my skin still crawl. Hi folks, I do not want my name out there on the internet because it never goes away. Anyway, a few years ago I decided to contact the BFRO about having yetis on my place. 
I call them Yeti because they have three toes instead of five. I always knew we had more than one cryptid on the place. I live on a river and have about 18 acres of land in total. The dogmen have been sighted off Lime Road, which also borders my river. I am from Pueblo, Colorado, and I live on the St. Charles River, which dumps into the Arkansas River. My researchers had me put out cams to see if I could catch any Bigfoot activity. I did, and over the years have caught other strange creatures on cam. I call them hybrids. My encounter started when I was only 8 years old in 1969, when a huge Bigfoot stood up in the front of my dad's Ali's Charmer's tractor, and it has continued to this day, and other creatures as well. I have a pic of the dogman that I caught in the river. It takes up a span of 4 feet wide. He has huge shoulders and is staring directly at the camera across from it. Yes, it is black, has ears that tip in towards themselves, and scars on its face, and it appears he is not too happy about having his picture taken. I felt very vindicated when I got that pic and I blew it up in word so I could get a good look at the creature. Quite ugly to say the least. It is a daylight pic, right about when the sun is setting. Good pic anyway. In the pic he is not standing but buffed out squatting, looking at the camera. That's not all guys, I keep my big dogs in at night because I don't want them killed. I have an older blue healer and an Irish wolfhound mix. He's not as big as an Irish wolfhound, but nonetheless is fast and aggressive. I almost lost him fall. He was three at the time. I came home and he wasn't there to greet me, and I found him pretty beat up with a six-inch slice at his groin, which almost cut into his phenol artery. He had no bite marks at all, but he was beat all over his body, like something pulverized him. He was so swollen that you could push in on the swelling like you were pushing in on a semi-infloated balloon. I called my pasture neighbor, who indeed said there was a fight in the river, at about 9 a.m. She said it sounded horrible and heard a dog screaming. Well, I said it was my dog. It changed my dog's personality. He is more cautious, skittish, and when these creatures are around, will not leave my side, nor will he venture to the river. Irish wolfhounds are ear, sight, and smell dogs, and when he stands on his hind leg or raises his head, smelling the air, turns around and comes back to me, something is afoot in the river. I have had many instances with these creatures on my place, and I have lost a few good dogs to that river and what runs it. My researchers are mostly into Bigfoot and do not come around much anymore. Matter of fact, one moved away to another part of Colorado. They are cryptologists. Gentlemen, be very careful with going into the woods with these things. I can prove these creatures and others are not what we know as normal animals. Dogmen are very hard to kill, as well as Bigfoot, or as well as the other creatures on my place. I hope you carry a very large caliber weapon when out humping it in the woods. I have a picture of a hybrid that kind of has like an ape-like face, huge shoulders, not much body and African lion feet. You can see four shadows in that picture, and it's quite a picture. Broad daylight, bright morning, and when I sent it to my researchers, they added some color to the picture to see the creature better and send it back to me. This is why I say dogmen, Bigfoot and other cryptids are out there, giants of old. March of 2017 It was 2.30 a.m. and another night of not being able to sleep due to back pain. I was lying on my side, reading, when my very close by neighbor's motion detector light turned on. This happens from time to time, and when it turns on it lights up the entire sides of my house. We have lived here an entire nine years, and I have never once seen anything walk past my bedroom window at night. Since I was facing my large bedroom window, the very bright motion detector light going off caught my attention. I looked up and saw the side silhouette of a dogman. I said, holy crap! It was walking past my bedroom window. I saw it from mid-shoulders up. The shoulders were huge and its head was huge. It had pointed ears like a German Shepherd dog and a longer snout. Its mouth was slightly open as I saw a large tongue that seemed to be lolling to the side of its mouth. 
When I saw this creature and spoke those words, I swear that thing slowed down and smirked and then kept going. That's all I saw that night. Last week though, while in my bedroom again, I heard something huge land on the ground behind my bedroom wall. That wall has no windows. I heard deep, kind of raspy breathing. I started praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over my house, grounds around it and all. I do this most nights, but sometimes I forget. I'm awake most nights until 3 a.m. or later due to having severe spinal issues as well as fibromyalgia. We live in a lovely manufactured home community. There are lots of trees around here, and it's very close to canals, large open fields, and woods. I know this is what I saw, but the fact that I saw that has left me amazed. Why is that, when so many are also seeing them? I guess I just thought that since I am in the house most of the time, due to my health, I would never see them. The space between my neighbor's house and ours is roughly 10 feet. My husband went outside weeks later, once I got the courage to tell him that this happened, and measured the area by the window. That dogman had to be at least 8 feet tall. What concerns me greatly is that no one in the police department or government will alert people to their existence. People are walking around feeling a false sense of security. I know I did. I won't even try to walk outside anymore. And yes, I have cautioned my neighbors, the ones with the security light. I can't think of any other details right now, but it's important for you to know that several years ago, a homeless woman was camping out down by the river here in Albany. She was found dead and her tent was torn up. I believe the police report in the newspaper said she was torn up as well, but I honestly can't remember any of the details. To the best of my knowledge, no one was ever caught for that crime. This is a sleepy town, just over 50,000 people. We no longer get the newspaper, so I have no idea if this happened again. I do know that a couple was down by that same area and saw a dogman. It really frightened them badly. I heard about that on another YouTube channel. I just want people to be aware so they don't go out at night anymore, especially near the river. But then again, we're not near a river and I saw one in the middle of the night. Thank you for reading this report and for doing all that you do to make people aware of what is really going on out there. I've got a tale for you. Still scares me shitless to think about because what I saw should just plainly not exist, period. I believe one of these dogman creatures tried to take my three-year-old son, well, three years old at the time. He's 10 now. At the time we lived in Indiana, I was with a company that moved me around every year or so. It was just me and my three-year-old son in a smaller two-bedroom, one-bath house that we were renting. We had neighbors, but they weren't close by. We had a lot of cherry and apple trees in our yard. That much I do remember. So much so that it blocked views of neighbors and even the road and was nice because it gave us a needed touch of privacy. My son's room at the time is facing the back end of the house, where my room is just on the other end of the hallway. One night I was sleeping, woke up to the sound of noise coming from outside my window, moving towards the back end of the house. Thinking it was somebody outside my house trying to break in, it was getting closer to my son's room, where the direction of the noise was coming from. I went into straight dad mode, grabbed my loaded shotgun that I keep locked away in my closet at night, ran down to my son's room thinking somebody was trying to break in. I'm running down my hall and I could start to hear clear as day my son screaming and I busted the door open. My son is screaming his head off at whatever the hell I was looking at outside of his window. Standing there with the most red haunting eyes was this animal that looked like it came from hell. Just a huge wolf face staring right at my son. I pointed my shotgun right at the window. The motion of me moving must have caught its attention because it quickly glanced over at me and its expression went from a sinister to an oh shit I've been caught kind of expression. It disappeared within a split second from the window. My son was in hysterics and so I'm trying to console him. He slept with me for the next few weeks, too scared to even go back in his own room by himself. 
We never saw that thing after that. I only stayed in that house for another five months and then moved again to Nevada where I finished out my last two years of my time with that company. My son being 10 now has an interest in things unknown and still being in Nevada has friends that talk about skinwalkers and are friends with friends in the Navajo so he thinks it's super cool. He is one of those who actually told me about Dogman, Bigfoot, and all those creatures in more detail because he's just so into cryptozoology. I'm really surprised because he doesn't even remember that night or what happened. Thank God, because I sure do. I wish I could forget it. I'll start off by saying that I have never believed in any of these sort of creatures but I saw something in early 2009 that really disturbed me and is making me change my mind. I was not under the influence of any drugs and I have better than average eyesight and the lighting was nearing sunset, but I was still able to see clearly. So I'll get this underway and explain my story and maybe someone can shed some light on this for me. I live in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, which is in West Central Minnesota about an hour drive from Fargo, North Dakota. My mother-in-law lives out in the country, about three or four miles out of Fergus Falls, and I was staying there a while with my wife and her mother while they went shopping in town. They called me and asked if I wanted to go to a 7 p.m. movie. So, I left the house at about 6.30, 6.45 to meet them at the theater, about two miles away from their house on a country road known as Wendell Road, Along the Mistinka River, I saw three white-tailed deer. Two of the deer were rather small, probably just yearlings and a larger doe, who I assumed was their mother. Me, being an avid hunter, lover of wildlife, and future wildlife biologist, stopped to look at the deer. I should also mention that I hunt in the area and have spent my whole life in the Fergus Falls area. The deer were following a small creek bed, which is in fact the Mistinka River, so there were hardly any trees, except for one. Maybe because I didn't see it there, but because of the tree, but I just noticed something crouching behind the tree on my side of the road. Looking at the deer, and to my belief, hunting them. It just sat there, looking at the deer, taking no notice of me, even though I was in my truck no more than 40 yards away, with a clear view, with nothing obstructing my view of it. It had one hand on the tree that it was bracing itself with. What struck me as shocking was the fact that it seemed to be a two-legged creature and not a four-legged one. Its hands appeared to have opposable thumbs and were rather slender and long, very unlike a wolf. The creature looked as though it had stood upright it would be over seven feet tall, with a protruding muzzle, broad shoulders, a slender waist, thick muscular thighs, and being as there was snow on the ground, I couldn't see the feet. He was deep, dark brown in color throughout the body. After several seconds of looking at the creature in shock, the deer ran off. Then, something amazing happened. It looked right at me, as though blaming me for losing his meal. He just sat there, looking at me, and blinking, but not moving. This scared the crap out of me, so I hit the gas pedal and drove off. It was very dark after the movie, so I didn't feel much like trudging through the three and a half feet of snow with the possibility of a monster lurking in the area who is currently looking for a meal that I scared off. So, at about 10 a.m., I went back there and walked down to the tree. Under the tree, there was no snow, so there were no tracks that I could see. But leading up to the tree, there were three tracks leading in from my grandmother-in-law's field, which was hard black dirt. And if you know what a Minnesota field looks like in late winter, early spring, you can't make out anything of the dirt. The tracks I did find were only about six to seven inches in length, but were clearly canine prints, with the exception of four toe looking marks in the snow. This occurred in early December of 2011. At around 2 a.m. in the morning, a friend and I were sitting in my bedroom, hanging out whenever we both noticed something moving on my surveillance monitor. I had a camera pointed down my driveway 
so I could see whenever I had company drive up. When we both looked up, I saw what appeared to be a large canine running on all fours and in mid-run, this thing came up on its hind legs and continued running across my field and across my driveway and into my brother's field on two legs. I was in shock and my friend immediately turned to me with her mouth wide open. I asked her, what did you just see? And she replied with, well, what did you see? I saw where this was going. So I then asked her, how many legs was it running on? She replied, it was running on four, but went to two. I then had a cold chill run through my body as I knew she saw what I had seen. I jumped up and grabbed my night vision scope that I had recently purchased and ran to my front door with my friend behind me. I must admit, I was hesitant to open that door for fear of it maybe standing there. So I opened the door while letting out a roar as to maybe shock it if it was there, but it wasn't. Hey, I didn't know. I cautiously walked out on my front porch and took the scope and scanned the front field. There was nothing to be seen nor do. I know which direction it went in besides I had seen it last. I waited until daybreak and went out to where it crossed my driveway and I found a paw print that was a good 12 by 12 inches. I was stunned. I just stood there looking back at the woods it had came from and looked south to where it was headed. I had no way to save the print and didn't think to take a picture at the time, nor was my camera recording at the time of the sighting either. From what I could see on the camera, this thing was massive in its upper body. I can still remember seeing the muscles flexing and the muscularity in its upper back as it came to its full height. It was running in weeds that came to my waist, but on all fours, it was a good two feet above them and when it went to full height. I would estimate it to be a good eight foot tall. Due to the camera showing only black and white, I didn't get to see its color, but I could tell you it was dark. Its head is something else that stands out as I could see the snout and its pointed ears which were laid back whenever it went to two legs. I am a research and development technician, so I am trained to watch for vivid details, and even though this thing was moving faster and faster than any human. I was transfixed on its form and what I was seeing. It was headed south into property that connects to the Stennis Space Center's buffer zone, which is over 100,000 acres of untouched and uninhabited acreage that was put aside for the space shuttle program in Hancock County. Since the mid-60s, so it is all the resources it needs in order to survive in those woods and to go undetected. I have always been an outdoors man, but since that sighting, I will not go out in the woods without a gun on me now. I know for a fact I do not want to run into that thing up close. I wanted to talk to you about a strange encounter I had years ago when I went turkey hunting down by the Mississippi River. I went with my brother, home we grew up together very close. A lot of brothers fight and end up being distant from one another. However, me and my brother grew up playing video games and enjoying the outdoors together. One of our favorite pastimes is to go fishing. So we got up early. This is probably about four or five in the morning if I recall correctly. And for whatever reason on this morning, we had forgot to bring any flashlights. So we were trying to track through the woods in the dark with all of our supplies. That's when we heard things that make this whole incident terrifying. Me and my brother are just a couple of feet away from each other, navigating our way when we begin to hear sounds like a stampede around us going the opposite direction into the thick wilderness. I'm not kidding when I say stampede. It sounded like multiples of these big heavy animals trotting around us, maybe not even 20 feet away. When I tell people this, during this part of the story, they tell me it was probably a bunch of bucks. But I'm here to tell you I know what a quadruped animal sounds like. This wasn't it. I have heard deer run many times, and this did not sound like it. It didn't sound like hooves. And when I say run, I'm talking about people. It sounded like multiple big heavy people were running all around us in the opposite direction we were going. Multiple people. Maybe like 10. Very, very heavy footsteps. 
the noises that accompanied were equally terrifying. My brother and I were frozen still as this was going on, all the while hearing grunts and moans. Grunts that were very guttural. Reminded me of a lion's guttural growl, almost. The whole thing had lasted 20 seconds, and then just like that, it was gone. I don't think we broke silence for maybe a minute or two after. My brother whispered, What the hell was that? I had no idea. I didn't even know what had just happened. We decided to screw the fishing trip right then and there and get back to the truck and go. The whole way back we were trying to make sense of what just happened and what kind of animal could even do that. We kept coming back to moose or bear or deer because it's the only thing that would or could make sense with how heavy this was, but we both agreed it didn't sound like something running on four legs. There's nothing in the woods that's heavy that runs on two legs. Very freaky to think about. And the growling? There's no animals we can pinpoint those noises to. This happened just last summer, when I went horseback riding with a couple of friends. It was about 3 in the afternoon, and the sun was bright, and it was perfect weather outside. The horses we were riding were actually my friends. These were well behaved, they had a lot of human contact and were ridden a lot. In fact, I had ridden on these horses a couple of times before, but it had been at least a few months, so I was joyful to be back on such a peaceful, loving animal. My friend and his horses choose between three to four different trails that go along their property, all of them being several miles in length at one point or another loop around. My friend is lucky enough to have hundreds of acres that he had inherited through family and decided to use them for horseback riding and hunting. Beautiful, beautiful backcountry, I will say. We were riding along the trail, and we were in an area with thick forest on both sides of us, which is not too abnormal since most of the trail does have thick forest, but other parts of the trail were open and more rocky and mountainous. We were chatting amongst ourselves when suddenly my friend's horse directly in front of me starts freaking out. Not even two seconds later, both my horse and my other friend who owns the horses starts freaking out. The horses, they were acting skittish and out of control. We're trying to calm the horses down when we start hearing what sounds like trees being knocked over and smashed. This was so loud and it wasn't far away from us. It just sounded like a massive bulldozer being driven through the woods coming straight in our direction. But there was no machinery sound, nothing. Just the sound of something very large coming through and crashing through the woods. Whatever it was must have spooked the living hell out of our horses. I don't even think there was much communication other than just pure action and fight or flight. We all turned around in unison with our horses, trying to get them to go back the way we came. As we managed to get a hold of the horses enough to start going back in the direction, we came and I turned my head around behind me to see a large pair of canine-like ears poking through the forestry. As my brain scrambled to find an appropriate answer for what I'm seeing, I then noticed these glowing red eyes slightly lower than the ears and realized we're being watched by something. Of course, the horses are moving relatively quickly now because they are so freaked out. Well, we all were because of the noise that is encroaching on us. We got out of there too fast for me to be able to properly discern what it was coming towards us. It didn't stop. I know for a fact I saw those large red eyes and the canine ears. It's kind of the same glow to the eyes that you would see in an eye shine when headlights hit eyes, but they were red. I have no explanation for the incredible and disastrous noises coming from the forest headed in our direction. The only thing I really know about that area is that it is really out there in the woods. There would be no reason for somebody else to be out there, since it's all private land. Due to the size and sounds that we heard, I really don't think it was a person. It could have been a large moose or something of that crashing size, but it was incredibly unsettling, and I'm not sure how to summarize the experience other than it freaked us all the hell out and made us very apprehensive about going back down that trail again. In northern Idaho, in Hoodoo Valley. Last winter, right after the first snow, my mother and I were driving home 
from a nearby town. You have to cross the train tracks twice to get to my house. After the second crossing is our neighborhood that all the kids of craziness hang out and talk about signs about giants in the woods and government cover-ups. The hoodoo legend of the Howler. We've always thought these people were talking about Sasquatch. We are members of the BFRO, but we never guessed a chance for Dogman. We were passing the Looney House and it was around 2200 hours with clear vision. There's a bull pine tree line to my right and a hillside to my left, and my property straight up on the top of the hill. My brights were on and I remember scanning the tree line as we were passing. At about 12 feet up were two red reflected eyes, surrounded by a black mass with shoulders, no neck, and in pronounced ears. My shock caused me to ditch the front, not paying attention to the road. We were high-centered for about five minutes. I stepped out to lock my hubs, and I remember that overwhelming feeling of being watched, which hurried my project. When I got back in the car, the feeling didn't go away. I quickly got out of the ditch and sped up the hill to the house. My mother was asking me why I was so worried, which she later found out why. About midnight, Mom was woken up by the most guttural howling you can imagine. Mom yelled at me through the house if I was awake, and I had already had my window cracked and listening to the sounds that we still hear every now and then. I then located Mr. Vic, who runs Dogman Encounters on the East Coast. He gave me the best info he could, which was extremely helpful. I then armed myself with an AR-15, 45 revolver, and a 380. It was the best I had at the time. I figured a guy on the phone might be full of it, and the only way to get the truth is to find it yourself. I tracked through the snow to the location I seen the eyes in the exact tree. There were no tracks in the snow. I thought I was just seeing things and got all worked up over nothing. But then, I looked up. Around 13 to 15 feet up in a tree, and about 7 feet up as well, were claw marks dug into the tree. I started looking for other trees and sure enough, there was a trail of claw marks from tree to tree. Eventually, the mystery trail came to an end and gave into another shocking trail. Large enough to dwarf a lion print were the largest dog prints I have ever seen. The trail seemed to step over large brush piles and bushes. Eventually, it led to the quad trail that follows the lower part of my property and Hoodoo Lake. What I saw next still lies there. A deer carcass with no head, no hindquarters, and no vital organs. On closer examination, the neck bone was crumbled and shattered, surrounded by torn flesh. Both legs were broken with no bite marks and the ribs had been separated in a pattern that indicated hyperextension. There is a lot of scuffle in the snow from coyotes, but I've never seen coyotes leave the breast meat and back straps. What concerned me even more was I found a leg wedged in the fork of a thin pine about 12 feet off the ground. This tree couldn't support a bobcat. I've never gone back in the woods behind my house without being armed since. My neighbors now think I'm the crazy one. I dress in full combat gear when I set trail cams. I guess I'm the weird one now, but I will tell you this. There is something in the woods that has the rancher across the street thinking a grizzly attacked his cows in November. Every neighbor hears the howls. I asked my landlord at the bar if he had seen or heard anything while he was living here, and his face just went white as a ghost. I haven't had a sighting since, but I did have an ice ball thrown at my car. There's no kids in the neighborhood. I don't know if you remember me. It's been months since I've written to you. A while back, I had traveled into the Arkansas Ozarks and found that dead black bear that was ripped to shreds. I'm sure you get a lot of stories sent to you, so hopefully you might remember mine. I might just have to try and dig up your episode with my story in it, but I digress. A few months ago, before all the quarantine craziness, I had traveled back into the Ozarks and was hiking around. I was actually searching for good streams to fish out of, and I was around the Richland Creek area, to be exact. I know there are bear in the area, and that's about the only large, big animal that I'm familiar with. The area and terrain that I was in is very rocky, 
and I remember walking along the edge of the creek, looking down into the very soft gravel. I noticed tiny indents. Well, not tiny, but tiny as in large footprint, but with a very light indentation because of the gravel. My eyes followed it about 10 feet, and then right there, on the very edge of the creek, were some of the largest wolf tracks I've ever seen. Of course, the one time I don't bring my camera with me, I see something like this. The only thing I can personally compare them to is my own hand. It was easily double the size of my hand. Absolutely massive. It was without a doubt a canine track. I mean, canine prints are pretty distinctive and they are hard to mistake. Normally, I would just suggest somebody had their dog out here, but I don't believe dogs get this big, of any breed. If I had to measure with my eyes, I would say in total it was maybe 14 and 15 inches in length, or from corner to corner, I guess. Anyway, just thought I would share that with you. This was back in February, when things were still very wet. I was visiting some friends down in Huntington, Arkansas, back in 91 for the summer. We decided to go to this neat little lake that was great for bass fishing. One thing you got to be careful about down there is water moccasins everywhere, and they will bite. So there I am, trudging along the bank of the lake, trying to watch every single step very carefully. That's when I started hearing commotion off to my left, when I turned my head and saw one of the largest creatures in my life staring at me, watching me. I've never been so afraid in my life. This thing looks like it came from the pits of hell. It was tall, standing on two feet, covered in dark black hair that almost looked to absorb light itself, it was so jet black. The eyes felt like they put me in a trance. These glowing red-orange orbs, or amber I guess you would call it. I've never felt such hate and malice off a of being before. As soon as we locked eyes, I just felt that this thing was bad news, and if I stuck around, it was really going to hurt me. I knew not to run because I didn't know what this thing was. If it was a predator, I would only incite the chase if I ran. So I tried to back away slowly, which I did until it was entirely out of sight. It never followed me, just continued to watch me even as I moved away. As I backed further and further out, this thing kept its focus on the lake as it was intently watching something in the water. I don't know what. When I made it back to my friends, they laughed at me, asking me why I was so pale and shaking. I knew in that moment if I told them what I'd seen, I'd be the laughing stock of the group for the day. So I just said I saw a big moccasin and nearly avoided it. I'm no horror movie fan, but sometimes when I've watched werewolf movies before, it really gives me the creeps because they always remind me so much of what I saw that day. Not saying it was a werewolf, just that this thing and those things from the movies looked very similar. I believe what I saw was definitely more than an animal. When it and I locked eyes, I could tell there was intelligence in this being I was staring at, and it wasn't just a wild animal. It felt evil, but still very intelligent, if that makes any sense. 